Good morning, Meridian friends. It's so good to worship together and to do so with Thanksgiving. Have you had Thanksgiving on your thoughts just lately? Uh, you know, we know as a people of faith, as a people trusting God, Thanksgiving is not an annual digestive event. It's a frame of mind. It's a state of heart. And with that frame of mind and heart, I want to invite you to turn with a Bible to Psalm 100. And I want us to consider how important it is to God that we worship. This week's focus really is on becoming a more worshipful people. And I pray that we can do that. Thanksgiving, of course, is certainly a big part of that. When we think of worship, I think most of us typically begin with music. Am I right? I don't know about you, I am just really, really grateful for the musicians in our church. We have such a variety of involvement of musicians uh, within our church, all different backgrounds, styles, generations. Uh, and I just love that our church celebrates all of those. Um, Jesus told us we're going to celebrate in spirit and truth. And, and so it really isn't about style. But isn't it true that in so many churches, music is controversial? I know this comes as a surprise if you've only ever worshipped at Meridian Friends. But music tends to be one of those hot buttons for churches. And it reminds me of a story that I once read about. It was about an old farmer that had gone to the big city church. If you haven't heard this story, let me just read it. An old farmer went to the city church one weekend and attended there a large millennial church. He came home and his wife asked him, well, how was the worship? The farmer said, uh, it was good. They did something different, however. They sang praise choruses instead of hymns. Praise choruses, said his wife. Well, what are those? And the old farmer said, well, they're okay. They're sort of like hymns, only different, said the farmer. Well, what's the difference, asked his wife. And the farmer said, well, it's like this. If I were to say to you, Martha, the cows are in the corn, that would be a hymn. But if on the other hand, I were to say to you, Martha, 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 oh, Martha, 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 the cows, the big cows, the brown cows, the black cows, the white cows, the black and white cows, the cows, the cows, cows, cows are in the corn are in the corn, are in the corn, the corn, corn, corn. And then if I were to repeat the whole thing two or three times, that would be a chorus. Now in case you don't know, there's actually a sequel to the story. Coincidentally, in the very same week, a young millennial from the city who normally attended with a very contemporary style at a large church, was in the old farmer's town on business and visited the farmer's small town church on the same Sunday. He came home to his wife and, he, and she asked him how things were. Well, he said, they were good, but they did something different, however. They sang hymns instead of regular songs. Hymns, said his wife, what are those? Well, they're sort of like regular songs, only different, said the young millennial. Well, what's the difference, asked his wife. The young man said, well, it's like this. If I were to say to you, Martha, the cows are in the corn. And this is my favorite part of the story. You can just picture a young millennial saying that, right? Martha, your cow, but we'll, we'll go with it. If I were to say to you, Martha, the cows are in the corn, well, that would be a regular song. If, on the other hand, I were to say to you, Oh, Martha, dear Martha, hear thou my cry. Inclinest thine ear to the words of my mouth. Turn thy whole wondrous ear and by and by to the righteous, imitable, glorious truth. From the way of animals, who can explain? There in their heads is no shadow of sense. Hearkenest they in God's Son, or his reign, unless from the mild 
tempering corn. They are fenced. Yea, those cows in glad bovine rebellious delight have broken free their shackles, their warm pens askewed. Then goaded by minions of darkness and night, they all my mild chili wax sweet corn have chewed. So look to that bright, shining day, by and by, where all foul corruptions of earth are reborn, where no vicious animal makes my soul cry, and I no longer see those foul cows in the corn. Then, if I were only to do verses 1, 3, and 4, and do a key change on the last verse, that would be a hymn. Well, I'm glad you can laugh with me <laughs> about all of those things. Because we are all different. And God calls us into this wonderful and in so many ways mysterious reality of combined worship. Weren't you just reminded hearing a live voice from Kathmandu, Nepal, about how much bigger God's worship is than just me and you? I wonder with that heart and with that desire to put our focus on God, and not on ourselves, that we could approach this psalm. Would you stand with me as you're able? And I'd like to read these instructions from worship, and I hope that we can receive these as direction for us as to how to worship. The scripture says very simply, shout for joy to the Lord, all the earths. Feel like something we can do? Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Heavenly Father, thank you that your faithfulness continues so much further beyond what we see or know. Thank you indeed that your praise continues through all generations. Help us even in this moment to keep our focus on you. It is in Christ's name that we ask. Amen. Please be seated. As we look at Psalm 100, I want to point out what I see as five simple instructions for us when it comes to our worship. I want us to slow down with these and don't fear that I'm going to try to build a case for one style of worship over another. Instead, I simply want to stick with what's here in the scripture and, and offer what I think are some instructions that totally transcend some of our preferences or styles. Verses 1 and 2 of Psalm 100 simply say, shout for joy to the Lord in the earth, all the earth, Worship the Lord with gladness. So the first point is simply that we are to worship the Lord with gladness. Have you thought about that this morning? You know, sometimes understanding the background of the original language is important. And here, I think it, it offers some help to us. Shout for joy is an interesting command where awareness of the use of language can help because it was used as a battle cry. In Joshua chapter 6, we can read the great story of how Israel surrounded Jericho and circled the city over and over. And then, with a loud cry, with a shout, the walls fell. This battle cry is the same word that's used in this command for you and I to give a battle cry in worship. You ever thought about that? <laughs> that you've come in today to celebrate the Lord's victory. There's, there's no doubt some emotion in those warriors who have been circling those walls, those enemy walls, and declaring the victory of God. There's, there's a battle cry, a shout. As a parallel verse in verse 2, worship the Lord with gladness. In this case, I don't think we need to know too much about original language to get the point. Worship the Lord with gladness in the original language means worship the Lord with gladness. <laughs> it's just that simple. And, and I think that says so much to us. It means that we don't drag ourselves into worship in a sense. And I'll say more about this a little bit later. But it ought not to be drudgery as we approach the face of God, our most 
holy king. Seems like sometimes when we enter the sanctuary, depending on our mood, we feel like being silent, not shouting. We feel like being somber and not necessarily coming into this place with sort of a put on or a fake gladness, if you will. And, and I think that that's partly sometimes where worship can be a discipline to bring what the scripture calls the sacrifice of praise. A sacrifice in this sense that we lay down the things that are so important to us at the moment. Recognizing that God is still in control to, to lift our eyes off of our grief long enough to trade that grief for joy, to be willing to do that. The sacrifice of worship and the sacrifice of praise. What we all do so naturally is we like to keep our focus on our own feelings and our own circumstances. And worship is a call to go outside of ourselves. Worship is a call to remember who God is, to think about what God is thinking about and the priority that God has placed on the circumstances of what's going on around us. I think Psalm 100 also has a really important message here for us, specifically as Quakers. Have you noticed, maybe you've read some of our history, maybe you've been to other friends' churches, maybe you know this, but as a denomination, we tend to be a little more introverted, a little more quiet. We wouldn't always want to describe Quaker worship as shouting, and sometimes even without gladness. And I want us to, to, to just receive what the scripture says about this, maybe with a little caution. I think what this is saying is that worship isn't necessarily more holy if it's quiet. All of us have different personalities. Some of us are really exuberant and outgoing by nature, and some of us are more introverted and contemplative and introspective. And, and so often in the, in the Friends Church, people who are introverted and introspective find it a little bit easier to sort of blend in with the worship of what's going on. And I hear others who are very outgoing that sometimes struggle with that a little bit. And they wonder what other people are thinking about them. If, if they're a little more expressive, oh, and by the way, and if that becomes our focus, we missed it, right? <laughs> but what I want us to, to simply focus on is this. Being exuberant, bringing a joyful song, worshiping the Lord with gladness, is not somehow less important than other aspects of worship. In fact, it's commanded by God. Sometimes I think we sort of, maybe depending on your personality, we wait for the part that most interests us. Maybe we think somehow that the sermon is more important, or the choruses or the worship or the hymns are just something that, that we sort of wait through. And I, I want to say that if this is really about King Jesus, and if this is about the way he told us to worship, then we might be missing something. I think that we're to worship God with all of who we are. Think about that. Worship God with your mind. Worship God with your will. Worship God with your feelings. All three engines. The story is told of uh, a jet going across the Atlantic, and all of a sudden the pilot coming over the intercom and saying, passengers, I'm, I'm sorry to disturb you. Just so you know, one of our three engines has gone out. And so everything's fine. We'll just be delayed. We'll be at our destination about an hour later than scheduled. So don't worry about a thing. About two hours later, the intercom comes on again. This is the pilot again. I just want to assure you that even though our second engine has gone out, everything's going to be fine. It's just that we'll be three hours late to our destination. To which one of the passengers turned to her husband and said, if that third engine goes out, we're going to be up here all night. <laughs> and then the pilot came through the cabin wearing a parachute saying, don't worry, I'm going for help. Your mind, your will, what you're going to do with it, your obedience, your mind, your will, and your feelings. I think that God desires for us to worship on all three engines. It, it isn't an either-or thing. And if we take seriously what the scripture says here, this is a command. This isn't an option. Worship the Lord with gladness. It's okay to engage your emotions in this. In fact, I think it's an important part of it. 
a barrier here that I see to genuine worship and, and worship that, that is really uh, the kind of worship God's calling for is simply peer pressure. People many times just aren't comfortable expressing their emotions in front of other people. We're afraid of, of people who are different than we are judging us. We're a little afraid that if they're less expressive, they'll think that maybe I'm not as smart or intellectual if, if I'm more exuberant. And, and, and again, those distractions, right? Worship isn't about that. It, it's all about putting the focus on God, where it belongs. But peer pressure is a real thing. Not everybody, not all of us, right? I'm putting myself in this camp. Boy, not all of us can sing that well. Some of us call ourselves prison singers. We're always behind a few bars. And we can never quite find the right key. But the scripture says for me to participate and really not to be afraid of, of what other people, how they respond to that in a sense. I certainly think being respectful is important. But, but we're really aware of others. And, and I, I just sense here that God is saying, look, it's, it's really clear. Things like clap your hands. How silly is that? I can't keep that rhythm. <laughs> I so appreciate people that can. I'm trying. <laughs> but clap your hands. And, and especially, again, for us as friends, um, this can be a bit of a struggle. We like the psalms that say uh, to be silent, <laughs> if you will. But do an interesting, I, I didn't study on this just a few years ago. I really wasn't aware of this. But almost every time the occurrence of God calling for silence in psalms, and there are a few of them, almost every time it's in the context of judgment. Nations be silent in expectation of the wrath or the judgment of God. It's an interesting thought, isn't it? Any time that you have kind of this corporate assembly for praise or singing, and the Psalms are loaded with singing, they themselves were songs, they were liturgy, there, there are these statements, shout, clap your hands, play all the instruments, with joy, with exuberance, with triumph. I just think it's part of worship, don't you? You know, my imagination, I, I think back to several years ago, Teresa and I were privileged, as Miranda was, and as the Georgias, certainly, and maybe more of you I don't know about, to travel to South America and to witness uh, worship down there. Wow, it's exuberant. <laughs> These people really know how to sing, and they do not care if they can't find the right key. And there is such beauty in that. It, it is so genuine. It's so expressive. It's so honest. And I know that that's a cultural thing. But I wonder what would happen if an Amaran watched you and I observe, if they were just to observe you and I watching a football game with our emotions in full gear. Even in front of the television for some of us, it's a weakness. And then if they were to watch us in the pew. And, and I really wonder what, what they would draw or conclude from that. I do wonder sometimes what our kids learn when they see those things. But more importantly than Amirans or kids, what is Jesus seeing? What does he want in his worship? Two, we're called here to worship with joyful giving. At the end of verse two, there's this phrase, come before him with joyful songs. In verse one, we come before God with, with a shout and with gladness. I really think that's an attitude to bring all of ourselves before God without reserve. Inner gladness is one thing. But there's another level to worship, rather than just our, our attitude or our whole self or our whole heart, but we're also to bring our song. When we worship the Lord with gladness, we bring ourselves. When we worship with a joyful song, we bring not only ourselves, but we're bringing to God some kind of a gift have a friend, acquaintance in Southern California who's a friend's pastor. And uh, when he first started dating the woman that would become his wife, he would give her roses every time he saw her. Boy, she liked that. that. That was a good thing. But then, as they got to know each other, she soon figured out that he has a rose bush in his backyard. <laughs> and he describes the transition of, of how less and less maybe excited she was. It's not that she wasn't appreciative, but okay, roses. <laughs> you, you get it? And he made some point out of it that uh, 
she wanted some evidence that he had really put thought into the gift. I know, you've never heard anything like this. I mean, this woman is different than all other women, I'm sure. But she just wanted to know that, that he had really put some thought and invested some time and care into this. And, and so, uh, interesting story. What thoughtfulness have you invested in worship? What does worship cost us? What, what is the thing that we bring? Not just ourselves, which is great, and she liked to see him. But what, if you will, is in our care that we're bringing to God? I think a barrier to this is selfishness. We sometimes sort of, we're, we're just naturally self-absorbed, and we're busy, and we're distracted in a million directions. And we honestly just don't think. It, it's not that, for even in our marriages, that our spouse isn't important to us. It's just that sometimes we don't invest that thoughtfulness. That would really mean so much to them. Especially us guys. They, they really like thoughtful. Just, just, yeah, I know you know that. We're also to worship with truth. Psalm 100, verse 3, talks about one of the other engines, knowing. Psalm 100, verse 3, know that the Lord is God. This is good theology. Know that the Lord is God, it is he who made us, and we are his people. And ultimately, worship reminds us of that, I hope. It reminds us that God is high and lifted up in our creator, and we're not. In the context of remembering who God is and getting a glimpse of his majesty, we recognize our place. And hopefully that, that leaves us a little bit less self-conscious, a little bit less focused on who we are, and much more focused on who he is. Now, part of this is our thinking. And our thinking is so very, very important. It's not just our emotions that are engaged in worship. I don't want you to, to any, in any way think that we have to trade critical thinking for blind emotion or enthusiasm, because we don't. We need good theology. What we teach and what we believe really matters. Worship comes in the context of good doctrine. Now, let me offer what I think is a barrier for many of us on this. It's pride. The reason I say that is because at some point, especially for us as adults, so I'm, I'm going to I'm going to let the students have a pass on this one. This is a word for the adults. We tend to have this idea that younger people still need to learn and that we don't. This whole idea that Sunday school is for kids, right? <laughs> At some point, all of us reach these places where we get stagnant in our thinking. Now, this may not be you. It could be that your primary way or easiest way of, of acknowledging and worshiping God is through the study of theology and, and you love uh, learning more and stretching and reading. Um, for others, it isn't. And, and it's easy to sort of bypass that part. You know, our brain is a muscle. And so the more we exercise it, the more we get outside of ourselves, the more we're stretched and we hear things that are, that are challenging to our assumptions and the things that we've learned before, the more we have capacity to learn. Our brains are stretched. So are you still learning? Are, are you still growing? Are, are you still memorizing? Are you still finding ways to challenge your intellectual understanding of God and who we are before God? I really enjoyed this book. Um, this is the last chapter that we're covering through a sermon. And Throughout the book, it's written by a college professor. That's what some of you notice right away, right? He teaches at Friends University. Oh, it's a professor. Don't be intimidated. Uh, keep working through it. If you've, only, if you've only finished three chapters out of these eight, wonderful. Chapter four is still there. Keep going. Wherever we're at, keep growing. Keep stretching. Uh, keep, keep on. But he frames things with these terms. He challenges what he calls false narratives. And he puts into very clear terms what those false narratives are. And then he replaces those with true narratives, something that's biblical, something that is right, something that is true. In this chapter, he puts it this way about, the, about worship. The false narrative that we so easily and lazily live by is this. Worship is a personal matter meant to inspire the individual. 
he challenges that biblically to replace that with a true narrative. Now, that was kind of, that was kind of deep. You want me to say it again? It's harder when you hear it than it is to read it. Worship is a personal matter meant to inspire the individual. True narrative, worship is a command activity meant to instruct a people. Now, if that trips your interest, read the chapter. I, I really think you'll like it. I think there's some great persuasion in there. See, God wants a joyful heart and, and a heartfelt expression of a song, even a shout of joy. And God also wants a disciplined mind. God wants to worship him in spirit and in truth. No sluggishness about theological development and learning. When we stop learning, our minds become less accustomed to stretching. And really, pride sets in. I don't need to learn more. But let me say this about how emotions work together with this. At least for me, when I learn something new, I'm reminded all over again how humble I am. When I, when I learn something new about a different field, for example, when, when an engineering student shows me a textbook, <laughs> whoa, <laughs> and, and I try to decipher what it even means, what it says, I don't know anything about that discipline. I have everything to learn about these simple laws of physics that God created. There's so much to learn. So when I learn something new, it brings me to my knees at the feet of my creator. I mean, for me, that's just such an easy way to worship. It, it's such a natural way to worship. I don't necessarily want, to, want you to overhear me singing very loudly. I'm willing. I can follow somebody who's really good next to me. <laughs> but, but on the other hand, uh, this part is just easier for some people than others. But I think it's there for all of us. To, to come to worship with this expectation that there's so much about God that, that it just brings us to humility. That when we do go to Sunday school, we're not just sitting there waiting, formulating our answers while someone's talking. No, we're genuinely listening to something that we do not know because we're there to learn. In our pride, we need to call attention to ourselves. In our humility, we, we, we're there to receive and approaching God with a sense of wonder. What a huge statement God made us. You know that involves physics? <laughs> that involves the creation of the whole universe and how this all holds together. God made us, we are his people. And we're the sheep of his pasture. Here's, here's another way I think God calls us to worship. It's with rest. The sheep of his pasture. Doesn't that remind you a little bit of a different scripture? Psalm 23 maybe? I love Psalm 23 because it says, He makes me lie down in green pastures. Don't you like that? It sounds so parental to me. If you've ever tried to get your kids to go to bed, He makes me lie down in green pastures. Jesus said the Sabbath was made to benefit man. Now, I've put all this emphasis so far on how it's to benefit God and we're to lose ourselves in it. And I really think that's what genuine worship is is that we have a sense of losing uh, our need to be recognized and noticed and understood in favor of giving God all the honor and all the attention and all the spotlight. But the Sabbath is also made to benefit us. God designed us in such a way that you and I need rest. We are not to, not to work seven days. We're to take a break from productivity, from accomplishing things, we're to take a break from worrying about things. Why is that so hard for us? Doesn't that sound like a great invitation? God invites you to let go of your worries for a day. What a great invite, please. <laughs> I can't solve all these things. I have to just put them aside at the end of the sixth day and not work on them, trusting that God will work on them. I have a limit. And being willing to observe Sabbath is, is an operation of faith. It's a step of saying, God, I'm putting this all in your hands now. I don't have everything figured out. I have so much more work to do, but I give this to you. And when we, when we enter a place like this, in a setting like this, with a spirit of rest, it makes such a big difference. A barrier, oh, let me say something about that. Um, do you notice in this psalm that gladness is commanded? Worship the Lord with gladness. And I guess I just want to tease your mind a little bit. Can you really do that? 
Can you command someone to be glad? Some of you are saying yes. Some of you are saying, well, I don't know. Is it a feeling? <laughs> think about it. I think it's a really interesting prospect. What I want to say about it is that, to me, it shows us that gladness is a command. It's something that God doesn't have a problem commanding us to be when we come into his presence. And I want to say this about it. It's a masculine feature of God. Let me explain that a little bit. In the ancient world, there were a couple of very important rules for common people when they entered the presence of the king. <laughs> this is so different than the way we treat our leaders in this country, right? <laughs> we have no problem throwing tomatoes. In that culture, that did not happen. In that culture in the first century, you did not speak without permission when you were with the king. You simply did not. You always kept your head lower than the head of the king. So the elevation was important. The king was always raised up. If you were equal, you bowed down. You kept your head lower. This is a sign of respect and submission and authority, as you can see. In that day, did you also know that you were to never show sadness before a king? Now, look, in the first century, this is what they understood about kings. I'm not saying that's a good thing or a bad thing. I just want us to understand that's what they understood. Part of God's revelation to us is that he is our king. You know, when Nehemiah approached King Artaxerxes to ask to rebuild the walls around Jerusalem, he was risking his life because he came in with sadness. And Nehemiah knew that, that because of his passion for Israel, because of his emotion, he could have his head taken off. That's how committed he was to getting this done. In that day, you did not show sadness before the king. To me, this sounds very masculine. This intense desire that God seems to have that we adore him and that we honor him. <laughs> Wives, do you know that in a lot of ways, men's needs are kind of simple. You know this, right? A simple verbal compliment. This, a guy could live on that for a couple weeks. He did such a great job fixing that door. That's all you have to say. <gasps> you hung the Christmas lights. So what if it's only two strands? Way to go. Thank you. That must have been so hard. <laughs> Guys love that. Am I wrong? They long to hear that. Isn't it interesting that God commands us to adore him? That God tells us to name what we're thankful for? That God is after that appreciation? And it even goes so far to say, and I'm going to say in a regal context, do it with gladness. Sounds kind of masculine to me. Doesn't it to you? In Dennis Prager's book, Happiness is a Serious Problem, it's one of the best titles for a book you'll ever find. Happiness is a Serious Problem. He says we all have a moral obligation to be happy. And he has some interesting points to back that up. That reminds me of masculinity. You got problems? Put on a smile and deal with it. Guys do that to each other. Guys, don't tell your wife that. <laughs> do we really need to talk it over? The roof's not falling down. I just stained the fence. Life is good, isn't it? What's the urgency? After all, it's he who made us. You want a reason to worship with gladness? It's he who made us. We're the sheep of his pasture. I see that as very masculine. But then you go to verse 3, and there's almost a shift in language. It's he who made us. We are his. And I see this very tender connection. We are the sheep of his pasture. Oh. Now I see connection and elsewhere in the Bible, everywhere. God is not only interested in our straight obedience. God is interested in connecting with us. Not just that we worship him as a sovereign king, but that we approach him as friend. Stacy Eldridge wrote a very interesting book called Captivating. And it talks about how God uniquely made women. And in a very balanced way, she shows that both masculinity and femininity, very unique from one another in their, in their, common, in their traits, together reflect the image of God. They, they really are very different. 
and they've been the source of conflict for generations. <laughs> we all know. If you will, there's something feminine in God's desire of what he wants for us. Not just reverence to him in spite of our feelings just to put up with it and be happy in his presence. Not just to honor him at all times, regardless of circumstance. And that's part of it. But to also come to him with our needs. To rest in him. To grow close to him. To be nurtured by the good shepherd. The men and women really are different in a lot of ways, aren't they? Do you agree with that? I love this cartoon. When a girl says hi to her friend, there are a lot of unspoken signals going on. Is there some truth in this? A million thoughts are on their mind. She's checking out her hair, evaluating her skin, judging her makeup, inspecting her jewelry. Are those jeans new or vintage? I'm not really sure. With the man, it's quite a different story. When he says hi, it just means hi. Well, you've been fishing with your friend. I can't wait to talk to you. You've been gone for two days. Tell me, what did you guys talk about? The boat. We talked about the boat. Do you know how big that boat is? <laughs> no, no, no. What'd you talk? Did you talk about his granddaughter and what she's going through? Oh, that's right. You spent three days with him. <laughs> it just didn't come up. <laughs> Different story, right? Aren't you glad that God's bigger than either one of our genders? Aren't you glad? God is the creator of all that. And in his pleasure, <laughs> he... he invents a recipe for conflict. I just love that because it's very humbling. A marriage will not succeed, isn't designed to succeed without God's care and God's help. Is Sunday different for you? Is it really a time of rest? Or is it just another day? Another day when you crowd things in and get things done because God sincerely wants your attention. He doesn't just want us to show up and report he just doesn't just want to, uh, in, in a very masculine way, just, just kind of do our duty, no matter how we feel or what's going on. God's invitation is one of genuine rest and care and shepherding. How's our attention before him? I, I think a barrier that we all face is that of busyness. Maybe, maybe the first thing I should have just pointed out is the simple word, the command to come. Do that. I, I could have, but I'd be preaching to the choir because you're all here busyness. But even if we are here, are we fully present? Have we set aside so many of the other distractions and things that, that pull for our attention? Are we just too busy? It's a gift to God that we organize our time, that we don't step into this environment in a dash and frazzled, but ready to give to God. Now, of course, worship is all of life and everything else, but I encourage you to check out this chapter. It, it, it tells us a little bit more about what it means to worship as a community, and I appreciate that. Be ready to give to God. More on that in a moment. Well, the great thing is God made a day of worship, not only for himself. God delights in our worship and our adoration and our gladness. He made it for us. But we need to be recharged to reconnect and find rest. The final ingredient here is that we're to worship with thanksgiving. And this is such an appropriate comment to end on with what's coming here in this uh, next week. But the truth is, thankfulness can be difficult for us, can it? We, the more we have, it seems the less, the harder it is to be thankful. An elementary school teacher was trying to teach thankfulness to her students, so she asked them to write down all the things they were thankful for. As she walked up and down the aisles, the students were writing things down, and she was very impressed when she came to Chad's desk. Because at the top of his list was the word glasses. Chad, I am so happy to see that you're thankful for glasses. And when you think about it, I mean, I wear corrective lenses. What a gift. Well, why are you thankful for them? And he said, well, they keep the boys from hitting me and the girls from kissing me. <laughs> there you go. 
That's not a bad reason to be thankful, am I right? Could we be described as thankful? Psalm 100, verse 4, enter his gates. The author clearly has in mind entering the gates of Jerusalem, then into the temple courts for public and gathered worship. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. I want to call attention to this homework assignment, and then I'll give you the barrier. Uh, on the back, if you look at it, and this is our final encouragement, I want to encourage you to take this one and hold on to it for the next month. Maybe put it in a place where you'll find it as you're thinking about getting ready for Sunday. We're entering the season of Advent, a wonderful time where we'll light some candles and, and think about the reality of God entering this world and what that means, Jesus becoming flesh for us. What a beautiful season we're headed into. Um, try this as you enter the Sundays for Advent. The exercise for this week is to go to church with what Richard Foster calls holy expectancy. For many of us, attending church is fraught with frustration and distraction. We're running late. Hurry up. I'm sure you've never heard that on a Sunday. Or, oh no, someone is sitting in my pew. I can't believe she wore that. Or the sermon was way too insightful and humorous today. Wow. I'm sure these are all barriers. In contrast, Worship is an invitation, not an obligation. And it's not about meeting my needs as much as it is about shaping my soul. For this reason, I'd like to make uh, your corporate worship more meaningful by engaging in a few acts of preparation. Prepare through margin. The proper attitude for worship cannot be cultivated in the 10 seconds we spend walking through the narthex. What a great statement. <laughs> We must prepare for worship long before that. One way is to go to bed early the evening before worship. What a thought. I just, could, could we honor our king with gladness by being well rested when we come in to worship during the season of Advent? Advent, by the way, is about deprival, right? It's about preparing our heart. This will allow us to awaken earlier. And you know that actually works. It really does, which will create some margin in terms of time. And I like this statement, and just decide for yourself if you think it's true. Time margin is necessary in order to create heart margin. Arrive early, uh, come with holy expectancy, and there's a sample prayer for what we can do. Final barrier, lack of preparation. So often we're just not intentional about being ready. We don't think about it in time. And there's really no reason for that. We can extend our experience of Sabbath beyond the 75-minute uh, borders of a worship service. Worship is really something that we prepare for through the whole week. And we enter in so unmindful sometimes of what God is doing, or we enter in so mindful of the good things God has been doing. This time we are going to uh, end our service with an offering. And I would like to lead us in a prayer before that happens. Most holy God, we crown you <clears throat> as our only and rightful king. We choose with all of our hearts, with all of our minds, with our will, with our soul, to submit to you completely. We praise you and we've gathered here to worship you and to honor you as more exalted than any one of us or anything that we tend to be enamored with. Jesus, you are the creator of all things and the king of the cosmos. And in your pleasure and for your pleasure, you made us as dependent followers, as sheep who need rest, who need pasture, who need lots of direction. And Jesus, as your sheep who are so loved and so cared for,
call you friend. We don't say this lightly. We consider the sacrifice that you gave to us as the Lamb of God, as the one who surrendered all rights, all privileges, all glory to die on a cross. Jesus, how I pray that you would help us, each one, as we think about a new season coming up. As we shift our focus, not, not to green and red or lights or anything like that, but as we shift our focus to the coming of the King born in a manger, humbly into this world. Jesus, teach us how to worship. We do not assume that we know exactly how. We're ready to learn. We're desiring, Jesus, that you would take our hearts and make us new again and ready us to honor you, our rightful King. We love you, Jesus. And it is in your name that we gather. It's in your name that we give this offering. It's in your name that we scatter today to go minister. It is in your name that we pray in the powerful name of Jesus Christ. Amen.